everyone's day so far? <laughs> Excellent, glad to hear it. So you're here at Chaos Theory, Immersive Theater meets Game Design. Uh, my name is Jessica Crean, and I am many, many things, as I imagine a lot of you are as well. They include uh, game design, immersive theater design, I'm a writer, I'm a producer, I'm a director, I'm a performer. Um, pretty much anything that has happened in theater I have done, to varying degrees of success, to be very, very real. Um, I'm also, I teach game design at Drexel University and University of the Arts, uh, mostly experimental and serious games, also intro to game design, some video game design, the whole mix. Um, I am the founder and CEO of I Can't Go On Games, and I am currently the uh, resident artist game designer at the Marshmillings Rockefeller National Park, making serious games about climate change and land conservation. Um, I am also... Uh, the kind of person who refers to herself as a creative multi-hyphenate because that's like the tip of the iceberg of things that I make and like I said, I sort of imagine that we're all in the same boat of just being general artist maker types. So today we're going to be talking a little bit about game theater. Uh, so game theater means a lot of different things. Uh, sometimes it can refer to LARPs, which are sort of on the theater side of game theater. There's a lot of performance that goes into it. And then there are escape rooms, which tend to fall into the, the other side of the spectrum of lots of game, a little less theater. So today we're talking about a space sort of in between those things. Um, for me, game theater is uh, the kind of work that borrows from the intimacy and the like really intense storytelling that goes into theater, particularly immersive theater, and the game design, the strong role sets, and like the extreme player agency that goes into the making and playing of games. So that's the space that we're going to be talking about today. And I'm the writer and creator of Chaos Theory, the piece that we're going to be talking about. Um, so there are a couple of things that games and theater do particularly well. And again, sort of veering towards immersive theater rather than like the theater where you sit in your seat and David Mamet words come at you. So this is a little bit different. Um, so they, they invite a lot of participant agency. There is a lot of opportunity to make meaningful choices. So that's what agency is for those of you who are you know, not necessarily game designers. Agency is just the ability for people to make choices that matter, that shape the world around them. Another thing that games and theater do really, really well is that they provide a really structured world. They say, this is the world that we are playing in, this is what it looks like, I'm gonna provide some boundaries for you. And you get to go crazy within them. And people really do that, you know, right? Like I had a bunch of people just destroy my set in the last time I ran Chaos Theory. They just like took all the props and threw them around and I was like, okay, well, guess this is the world we're in right now. I did invite that, so here we are. Um, so there's another thing that is really great, particularly about games, which is that it provides really clear rules and outcomes. Generally speaking, if you're playing a game, you know the win state. You know how to win, even if you don't know exactly how that win is going to happen. If you knew how it would happen, you probably wouldn't want to play. Unless it was like Candyland and you're playing with a four-year-old, in which case, great, go to. Um, storytelling is something that is, is particularly strong in theater. Theater pieces, particularly immersive theater, spend a lot of time building these narratives, really tight-knit stories, where you can come back time after time and have a different experience. So one time you're following this character, another time you're following that character's like, ex-scorned lover, learning different things about the story as you go, building this like, beautiful world over time. And something that is, again, like particular, I think, to theater is that theater is really great at building tension. Right now, we're in a theater, and anything can happen, right? Fire alarms could go off. I could just decide to fall over and cry. Like, these are things that are probably not going to happen, but could. There's something about being in a live space that just invites this, this possibility. There's this space for things to happen that we don't have very often in, in a lot of game spaces, or we're not paying attention to it. But this is a thing that is also just life, right? There's just always potential for things to be happening and happening differently. So this is a space of great agency, and great possibility space. And immersive theater just puts some little boundaries on that and says this is the world that we're playing in, but like maybe go ahead and break it. So for this piece in particular, uh, I made a piece about chaos theory that was game theater. So why chaos theory? Uh, for starters, I am a chaos agent. I have always been a chaos agent. <laughs> um, even when I was little, I was just like running running havoc around everything. So chaos is a state that feels comfortable to me in a lot of ways. Um, and the other thing is that I woke up in 2016, November, just like everyone else did, and was like, what the hell is happening? Uh, and then I woke up the next day and nothing had changed. And I woke up the next day and I definitely still wasn't dreaming. So everything felt just totally chaotic. I felt like I had been dropped into this world where I didn't understand anything. The normal rules didn't apply anymore. There was this crazy uncertainty and I didn't know what to do with it. I felt panicked and I felt out of control and a lot of people did and I was having all these conversations with everyone about how awful it felt to feel so much uncertainty and so, so, so much lostness. 
And so I began thinking, okay, if I keep waking up to find that I'm not dreaming and this is our actual reality, then I should probably start figuring out exactly what chaos is and why I'm afraid of it and maybe, maybe how we can use chaos to help shape the world positively if it's just gonna be a part of life for a while. So that was the impetus for chaos theory. So I started doing a ton of research. I started researching order and chaos and the Mandelbrot set and formulas and all of these things that went into everything that I could possibly find about order and chaos. And I felt totally panicked, right? So what I discovered was that there's two kinds of chaos. And one of them is colloquial chaos, or what I started referring to as colloquial chaos. It is this feeling that everything is going off the rails and is horrible and awful and something has to be done about it. There has to be a change. It's not a sustainable state. And that is the, the way that we use chaos generally in society. Is like this is a thing that is, is on the edge of falling apart. And then there's this other chaos that is chaos theory, which is kind of the exact opposite of that. Chaos theory is ridiculously structured. There's a, a, like a really intense system to this. So this was bad news for me because I was like, oh dear God, there isn't even one kind of chaos. What am I supposed to do with this? But the good news is, as an artist, if you give me conflict, I can make a story. And if you give me a system, I can make a game. So as a storyteller and game maker, I was like, game on. Great, let's do this. So I started figuring out if there was a way that we can use chaos theory to help us understand colloquial chaos. So it went pretty badly for a while, not gonna lie. It was really, really hard to try and write this thing. Um, but my mantra this year is, or last year and this year really, is the same as many game designers, which is to fail faster. So I started making really bad things and inviting my friends over and telling them to like, please, please drink more beer and just sit through the bad things that I'm going to be doing. And they did because they're amazing and that's how community works. And so what eventually came out is this character named Dr. Sayok. Uh, you may notice that I am into wordplay and puns, so if you're into that, good. If you're not, I'm really sorry in advance. So Dr. Sayak is this character, um, and she is a professional chaologist. And my background is in immersive and, design, and uh, devised theater, so I love making characters and stepping into other roles. So this was super fun for me. So I made up this character, and she has a voice and a background, and what she is trying to do is understand her whole life through chaos theory. Anytime that her world falls apart, she reverts back to why, and she looks at chaos theory as a, a source of, of answers for this. So she does this for her middle school crush. She tries to find out why he doesn't like her through chaos theory. Uh, she tries to figure out the patriarchy through chaos theory, and she tries to figure out her own life and career through chaos theory. And so that's sort of the structure of the piece. We get to go through it with this character. What does it look like when your world falls, world falls apart, and how can chaos theory help us understand these feelings of chaos? So after I had this character, I started to build a world around her. So this is sort of from the, like the fully baked version of the piece, which didn't exist for a very long time. But basically, people come into this space and they are at a meetup. It's not a TED Talk. She's not that fancy. But they're at a meetup. There are like some pretzels and hummus, and they fill out a name tag with their real names and their area of expertise, whatever that may be. And people take it to varying degrees of seriousness, and that's great. We like that. Um, so they are playing as themselves. And this is great because people are really wonderful and there are a lot of role playing games out there where you can take on this other entity and be them. But in this particular instance, what I was interested in was helping people figure out their own individual feelings of chaos. So in order to do that, you've kind of got to be yourself. So that was a big challenge of the piece was like, how do we do the very lightest of larks? The very, very lightest, just a tiny, tiny hint of unreality. So we're really facing this world where we have this fictional circumstance, this fictional character mixed with real characters, real science, and where are the boundaries between these things is the thing that got played with a lot in this piece. So after the narrative had been built, I started looking at how to gamify chaos. How do you turn this into a game? So I started with uh, turning things that were unrecognizable into things that felt relatable and even beautiful sometimes. And the first thing that I looked at was sensitivity to initial conditions, which is one of the cornerstones of chaos theory. But inherently, just kind of doesn't make any sense as sensitivity to initial conditions. So I made a game out of it. And this game is developed on the core mechanics of deterministic chaos, which is that there are a set of events that happen, and then something else happens because of them. Chess is a deterministic game. There are set rules, and then a whole bunch of different things can happen, a whole bunch of different outcomes. So that is sensitivity to initial conditions. So the game that came out of that is something that I started calling the circle game. Um, and the rules are this. There are two teams 
that emerged, about three or four players each, and the goal of both teams is to draw the world's best circle. Not a good circle, the world's best circle, because it has to be the most orderly of circumstances possible. But there has to be an element of chaos to it, so each individual team member has to choose for themselves a role, and they have four roles to choose from. Ensure that the circle gets drawn at all costs. Ensure that the circle does not get drawn at all costs. Claim as much credit as possible while doing the least amount of work on the circle and seduce everyone in your group and the other group and the room at large. <laughs> so this goes about as well as you would expect. People start making out, people start ripping up papers, people start running around the room trying to keep the paper away from other people. It's complete and total actual chaos. It's the feeling that everyone knows to be chaos. So it's this really familiar space that we start this piece out in. I'm like, ah, yes, here's chaos. I know chaos, we're all in chaos together. And then from there, we start talking about safe words because clearly that isn't going to be an issue in our piece. So we have just like a way of dealing with safe words and creating a, a, like this a whole system around making sure that people feel safe in this piece. Um, and then we realize that sensitivity to additional conditions is actually something familiar to us. It is the butterfly effect, just known by a scientific name. So because we've already played a game about sensitivity to initial conditions, then we have a little space to play around with something else. So what I did uh, over the course of about a month, much to my director's dismay, is I would come in literally to every rehearsal like, okay, I think I've got it now, and I'd have the crazy eyes, and I would be wrong. Um, but I did eventually figure out how to turn this character's uh, middle school crush, her love life when, as a child, uh, into a formula. So it starts off as uh, this like really ridiculously mathy looking thing, but by the end she has turned the infinity symbol into matching Lord of the Rings wedding rings and a baby, she draws a baby out of it. The square root sign becomes the base of a house, which she draws as a little domestic sign for her and the love of her life. Uh, the X to the power of zero becomes an infinite string of hugs and kisses. All of these things that like are ridiculous and very mathy at the beginning become very personal by the end. And that's sort of the theme of a lot of this piece, is how do you take these really abstract and things that don't necessarily make a ton of sense and make them ridiculously <coughs> relatable. So that is what she's doing with her life and is what we as human beings are often trying to do with our lives. So at this point, we've introduced abstraction, playfulness, teamwork, safe words, time constraints, and impossible tasks, all in, within like a game and a half. So the next game that comes up mixed with these like comedic narratives is fractals. So fractals are basically this idea that there are microcosms inside of microcosms. This is a fern. All of the little pieces of a fern look like the big fern. All of the little pieces of the little piece of the fern look like the piece of the fern that looks like the big fern. Everything just looks the same. They are self-similar. So I made up two games that played around with self-similarity. Again, asking the audience to actually embody these facets of chaos theory, to put their bodies and their minds into this space. So one of them is basically just telephone, just like passing a message along, but it's the story of how she got her period for the first time, because theater stories, weird. Uh, and the other one is a game called Infinite Regress. And it's this idea that systems are built up fractal by fractal, step by step. So what do you do when you have a system that's already been created and you want to break it down? Can you do that with fractal analysis? So the audience tries to do that. So we start off with uh, something, a system that someone wants to break down. So does anyone have something? What is a system that you would like to see broken down? The government. The government, great. So fractal by fractal, let's break this down and see if we can get back to the initial conditions. What caused the government? Chaos. And what caused chaos? Humanity. And what caused humanity and people? Mm. And what caused mm. a lot? And what caused a lot? Everything. Anyone else want to hop on here? <laughs> so this is what we do for a really long time, right? Until we see these patterns develop. So this is the whole game: is just figuring out these complex systems and realizing that we can't actually break this thing down right now. Um, but there are some successes that are built up along the way. But this exemplifies how fractals work in a really playful and really stupid way. And it also relates how chaos theory can be applied to these real world situations. Again, in a really playful way. So there's another big idea in the piece, which is strange attractors, which is really just like too good a name not to be playing around with, period, but this character, Dr. Sayak, loves very deeply. So this is a really fun space to play in. And basically, strange attractors are this idea of preferences. Matter in the universe is drawn to specific points, and it ignores other points, and it has this magnetic pull to some points. Humans are the same way. We're drawn to people, we're drawn to ideas, we're drawn to all kinds of things at the expense of everything else in the universe. So how we choose those things is really, really interesting and worth thinking about. So uh, in this game that is developed, everyone has to get up, I'm not gonna ask you to do it, don't worry. Everyone has to get up and they move towards a corner of the room that they feel pulled towards. They have 10 seconds to do it and then they have to get there. And then we start naming the corners of the room. Earth, Mars, uh, the moon, dying pear tree in another dimension. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, move towards the corner that you are pulled towards. 
Republican Party, Democratic Party, anarchist teenagers, squirrel. 10987654321. People are just trusting their guts, following these impulses, going from place to place, seeing what they are drawn to, without having to think too much about it, just really letting their, their instincts take over. Um, and then we get into sort of like uh, activities. This corner a cell tells each other the story of how they got their names. This corner is a group singing corner. This corner is a corner called Shake Up Your Guts. And at Shake Up Your Guts, uh, you have to punch another person straight in the stomach. People do it. <laughs> but it's real. It's really this idea that like, okay, we have established this world where you have some agency. We have established that you are making choices and that your gut has something to say to you. So how much do you need this? How much of a shake up do your guts need on a scale of one to 10? So the people at this station have this ability to say like, okay, I want a one, give me a belly rub, or just like say something nice to me, hands down, we're done. Tens, we've never gotten a 10. But people want the experience, which is really strange, but also kind of lovely, right? People want the experience of being punched. They want to know what these sensations are, these intense things that happen in the world. They want to know what it's like, but they don't want to punch anyone else. Or at the very least, they don't want to be seen as someone who punches someone else. It's hard to tell. <laughs> so these, these are all things that get introduced in this game. So we are now in a space where we've been talking about chaos theory, but there are also these moments of uncertainty that have started creeping in, these really serious moments of uncertainty. Um, so the next thing that comes up is misogyny in the scientific community, which, strictly speaking, probably not an actual facet of chaos theory, but definitely a part of chaos theory, right? Very important part. So this is Dr. Edward Lorenz. He's a real person. He was here at MIT, actually. So a lot of this piece actually takes place in MIT. Uh, and he and my character in this piece, totally not real, have this really intense, passionate love affair. <laughs> Yeah, uh, so they tell the story of how they fell in love and they do all of this research together and they work in the lab together trying to figure out the practical applications of chaos theory in everyday life. And what they end up with is this formula. And so she's reading this formula and the audience is asked to participate in it. The formula is a series of questions that she provides these words and phrases and the audience responds with either order or chaos. So we'll play for just a minute here. Uh, loose threads, order or chaos? Chaos. Okay. Uh, alphabetically organized spice racks. Order. 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 Poetry. Order. Chaos. Pottery. Order. A college education. Chaos. Chaos. Love. Chaos. Chaos. Sex. Chaos. Chaos. Dead people. Order. Order. Babies. Chaos. 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 Writing scientific papers. Order. Order. Submitting Chaos. papers to scientific journals. Chaos. Chaos. Not hearing back after submitting papers to scientific journals. Chaos. Chaos. Department heads picking which papers go into scientific journals. Chaos. Chaos. Department heads having penises. Order. Order. Department heads having exclusively penises. Order. Order. A room full of penises talking about a people, people who submit papers to scientific journals. Order. A room full of penises talking about a particular person who submits papers to scientific journals. Order. And this is exactly what happens. It gets quieter and quieter and quieter. <laughs> As we go through this whole game where the audience is actually asked to choose which situations are orderly and which are chaotic. And it gets very, very personal. And she starts, you find out this story as she goes along about basically how she has been ostracized from the scientific community for making what could be perceived as a mistake, but wasn't necessarily a mistake, might have just been living chaotically. And we find out that Dr. Lorenz has also made mistakes and that he was lifted up from those. He was heralded as having this out of the box thinking and has become a celebrity, whereas she has been shunted off to the side uh, and labeled basically like a, a crazy woman. So this is all happening over the course of this one game. And this is the entire game. These are all of the things that get said. It's a long game, but uh, also she might have had an affair with Billy Blanks. There's some things going on in the story. Because it's, it's weird, and the whole piece is meant to be like very accessible and funny. So oh, I forgot to mention, uh, she, I, am completely naked during this entire game. Uh, so in a previous game, she has gotten naked. She is shameless, because there are things that just happen in the game, and she doesn't see them as sexualized. Um, but so as these things are happening, as we're finding out this story of her being ostracized from the scientific community, she's just buck ass naked the whole time. And that ends up being really, really important because we go from this being really, really silly to being something that is uncomfortable and scary and realizing that actually the only reason that we're playing this game, the only reason that we're having this conversation is because these events happen to, to a female body. So it's again this sort of play that you have between, between games and playfulness and being in a theater space where we are all literally in the same space together, living through this moment and having this experience together. These things just can't exist uh, without each other. Like these, this is why it is game theater, is that these things really go hand in hand. 
So as this happens, there is one more game, one more major game in the piece, and that really deals primarily with colloquial chaos. So we've moved from these facets of chaos theory, and we've sort of shifted slowly into this world of colloquial chaos. Uh, so it is called, at any moment, a velociraptor might enter this room. And it is called this for a couple of reasons. One is that I, Jessica, am very, very scared of dinosaurs. <laughs> Uh, I literally had not seen Jurassic Park since I was five years old and I had nightmares and had to be carried out of the theater in tears. Uh, and so I watched it last summer in preparation for making this piece by myself, alone, in this gigantic house where I was house sitting because I knew that if I was going to be asking people to do things that were scary, then I had to do them myself. So on the inside, this watching Jurassic Park was one of them. This was like my private one. And then there was the whole just getting naked in front of a bunch of strangers to say like, hey, if I can be this vulnerable, you too can be brave and take risks and face uncertainty. You have to be able to give these things if you're going to ask for anything in return. Uh, so that is what the, a lot of this was about, a lot of this vulnerability work. Uh, so I made up this game, at any moment a velociraptor might enter the room. And it is all about transforming panic into agency, which was the whole impetus of the piece to begin with. So in this instance, the audience has now been trained. They now know that they are when to get out of their seats and move around. So they're asked to move to one corner of the room. But now, instead of just being random corners, there are stations. And they are um, looking forward, uh, looking back, moving forward, staying present, connecting with strangers, and falling in love. So they're all sort of like the big things in life, the juicy things. And so people move towards stations, and there are cards there. And there are three different levels that you can choose from. So over the course of time, they get more challenging. So in the first round, uh, if you're at the falling in love station, which is where some of these are from, you have the option uh, to like write down the name of someone who holds a piece of your heart and is maybe holding you back and dissolve it in water. There's some dissolvable paper and water at the station, so you can write this name down and just watch it go away. And then the next round up is that you can hold two other people uh, and feel their pulse for two minutes. And the reason that these things can happen is that because there's already been a lot of intimacy built in the piece, because we are all in the same space together and we have been putting our bodies on the line throughout the piece, all of us together. And so all of these things are happening simultaneously and you know that there are two minutes per task, so you know that there is an end coming. And at this point, um, my, this character that I play is a trusted entity because she hasn't done anyone anything wrong up until this point. Even with the punching, she's still somehow a really trusted figure. So there's a lot of crazy stuff that has come out of this piece, um, and they start within this game. There are a lot of things that have happened with this game. <coughs> Friendships have been forged. Um, we'll get into a little bit more of it in a little bit later, but um, there's a lot of chaos within the piece. There's a lot of movement and running around, but everyone has their own orderly set of things to do. So there's one card where you can call someone you haven't talked to in over three years. So people have reconnected and forged these really strong friendships. And people are still writing to me and telling me about all of these things that have happened, which is like the most heartwarming thing. Um, some people have adopted animals. Uh, one person learned to ride a horse, which is one of his life goals. Um, three people have gotten tattoos that they had always wanted after leaving the show. Uh, a couple people have shaved their heads or parts of their heads. Two people fall in love, Judy and Gary. They're still together five months later. They met at the first show of Chaos Theory. Um, one person started an LLC, right, raised $1,500, and a board of directors within a month. He's still going strong. He started directing his own pieces. It's pretty incredible. Um, and we've had a lot of audience repeats. People have come back three, four, five times. They bring their friends because they want to see how they'll respond to it. Um, and also, just in terms of like the, the, we'll talk a little bit about the iteration of this piece, but the first review that we got was god awful. <laughs> Whoever came to see the show hated it. They just hated the show. They were like, this is awful. There's not enough chaos in this. And it was a very different show at that point. Um, but ever since then, as the show has grown and evolved, we've gotten nothing but raves, uh, mostly from, but from reviewers, but also from the people who've come to see the show, which is just really rewarding. Validation is always nice, right? We're artists. Um, so there are a couple things that I want to talk about the changes of the piece, because this piece started in the Philadelphia Fringe Festival and had three shows and developed like a weird fan base of people who were like, yeah, punching in the guts. This is crazy. And then we've sort of like evolved the piece over time because after the Philly run, I got directors, which was amazing. Because <laughs> up until then, it had been me locking myself in my room, writing and inviting my friends over and providing them beer and asking them to punch each other in the stomach uh, and listen to me give crazy monologues. So having directors was a real game changer. I highly recommend it to anyone ever, no matter what you're doing in life. doesn't matter if it's theater. Um, there was also in the first iteration a 10 minute quiz break where audience members were asked, were given either a quiz on chaos theory, or they were given a quiz that would tell them which 1860s presidential nominee they most closely resembled. Uh, so that was a thing that happened that got cut. Hopefully it'll make its way into another game, but it was not right for this piece. <laughs> there was no Jordan Palladino, her childhood crush in the first iteration. Um, the chaos theory game that we just played uh, was a monologue. So the, uh, there was no audience interaction in that in those first few shows. Um, 
The script right now is 13 pages. It's a 75 minute show, it's a 13 page script. I have written probably 500 pages at this point. Um, but it's all gotten pared down, games go away, new games arise, things where monologues become games. So all of these things happened over the course of about two months. Um, I also mentored people from the Philly version, I still am. Um, they have a year with me. So for a full year, we check in at least once a month. For one or two of them, I'm checking in every day. Um, and, or they're checking in with me every day. So basically, I'm just being their artistic guide to being their best chaos agents. But that was unsustainable. So for the New York version, when we took it to New York, um, we now have like an extended version that takes place mostly on Instagram. So people can sort of like help each other out instead of just having me be there all the time. Um, and we added some frilly socks and some more props in, and a whole bunch of other stuff that you are welcome to ask me about. So this is the timeline of the piece that first got performed in March, a whole bunch of stuff happened, I spent two months panicking and not writing anything, and eventually it got performed um, later on. So just a few quick takeaways. Um, immersive, interactive, and agentic storytelling is at the heart of game theater, but it is different for everyone. Um, where there's a system, there is a game. Games can help, help clarify abstract ideas, so you don't need to build a theater piece around this, right? If you have an abstract idea that you want to play around with, like you can just find the core mechanics and start messing with it. Um, and that immersive theater experiences are really great places to just test out certain kinds of agency, and that you don't need to do role playing in order to do that. You can play as yourself and have these really crazy things outside of the game world happen as a result of those, those experiences and those risks. And last but not least, the best advice ever, 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 ever is to just fail fast. Get your friends, get some beer, get some people to watch your thing. Um, and then don't panic when they're like, yeah, I was never really into that part of the show. You just take it and, and run with it, as you all probably know. Um, so this is me, Chaos Theory is being performed in New York next month um, on March 13th, if you have any interest in seeing the whole piece. Uh, if you want to play the 1860s presidential quiz, you can find me on Medium, um, or just contact me in any, any possible ways. Um, I think we have just like a minute or two. Any questions? No, is that a question or a get off? Y yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> both? <laughs> okay, great. Thank you all for coming.